So yes, uh, for our speaker today, we are delighted to hear Dr. David Potter. I met Dr. Potter, well, I've known his family for a long time, uh, going way back. And actually, two of his daughters are here in Manila. They serve at BJNBC. Um, and, and he's got an extensive family that is serving the Lord in multiple places across the world. So that speaks well of him. Um, and it's definitely a high credential. But together with that, uh, Dr. Potter it has also decades worth of experience, both teaching academically at the seminary level, and then in recent years, recent, uh, yeah, well, you'd have to give us the number of years, uh, serving as a missionary in Hungary. And so both sides, really, and that's um, it's an unusual mix and a really a powerful mix, both the academic side, the academic credentials strongly achieved and strongly used, and then also the practical credentials from multiple years of ministry there. So, and then the final piece of this is that what he's going to give us in our lectures are tied specifically to Hungary and to his location. So I think that's a pretty neat um, kind of an uh, indicative observation here that in terms of his own interest, uh, the Lord put him in Hungary. Well, he's put some time into just studying his context and learning about the history of his context. And that that speaks to all of us. It's, um, it's a great thing to learn about the place you live in <laughs> and to be more familiar with those realities. So uh, that's that. And we will, I will hand the time over to him in just a minute or two. Let me encourage you here. It's an encouragement I've made before um, going way back, but I'll just toss this encouragement out there again. I know that it's not always appropriate or it doesn't always fit life uh, and that's okay. Um, but as much as you're able, it actually helps the teacher if they can see your face. And I was talking to Dr. Potter earlier today while we were setting some of this up and he mentioned that uh, just the challenge of teaching to a faceless group is just, it's just different. So <laughs> to be able to teach the real people, it's a much better kind of situation. And uh, I would encourage you then if you're able or willing, go ahead and turn on your cameras. Uh, the reason for doing that really is try it sometime. It is a lot easier to teach people than it is to teach little black boxes with names on it. It's just so much easier. Okay, that's it. So if you're able and uh, if that fits your situation where you are, then great. That would be a help to Dr. Potter. And um, that's it. Okay, uh, Brother John Glass, if you are able to lead us in prayer. And then immediately okay. after that, Dr. Potter, it's your time. And we'll look forward to what you have to share with us. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity that Joel and company have made that we can come together and learn not just your word, Lord, but many things surrounding it and the issues that face our life, particularly through this class, from the history that we've been handed. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'd use this time to be instructed to us and to open our eyes and lead us forward based on the history, not even looking to the future, but living in the present. We ask that you'd uh, give this dear brother the words to say and the wisdom to say it. We ask that you be with our hearts, Lord, open our eyes through your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Dr. Potter. I am very excited <clears throat> to be able to tell you about uh, two heroes from Transylvania, of all places, um, that you almost certainly have never heard of before, and you will be glad to have met them after this session. Um, Transylvania would not seem to be the likeliest place to search for heroes, much less for Baptist heroes, but two outstanding servants of Christ sprang from that region, nevertheless, born 90 years and 75 kilometers distant from each other. The names were Mihai, or Michael, we would say in English, Cornia, and Livio Ola. A further link between the two is the fact that the scene of Ola's most few fruitful ministry, the Second Baptist Church of Oradia, Romania, began with 12 of Cornia's converts in 1906. Cornia was a Hungarian who loved and preached to Romanians. Ola was a Romanian who loved and preached to Hungarians. And given the ethnic enmity between Romanians and Hungarians, both thus manifested the love of God, shed abroad in our, their hearts by the Holy Spirit. These two heroes deserve much wider recognition in the West than they have received. 
And as I said, anybody there ever heard of them? No. Okay. And uh, Transylvania is an area of rich farmland, timber, mineral resources. The area was ruled by Hungary from at least the 15th century. After the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I, most of Hungary, most of Transylvania became part of Romania. The population of Transylvania is mostly Romanian, Hungarian, and Gypsy with significant, significant amounts of other minorities. Um, first, just as a preface to the information about Cornia, much of the information comes that I give you comes from a book, Cornia Chronica, or Corn, Cornia Chronicles, a Hungarian book by Bertalan Kerner, who compiled it during World War II based on documents and interviews with people who either had a living memory of the events or had heard them from their parents and grandparents. Kerner was not a particularly good writer. Nevertheless, the book is a treasure for the information it preserves. So in what follows, I heavily rely on an English translation made by Bela Horvat, who formerly was one of my co-workers. Kornia was christened in the Hungarian Reformed Church of Solonta, um, Bihar County, Romania, in February 28, 1844, his parents being Mihai and Katalin Kovac Kornia. In the mid-19th century, Transylvania was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, even though a large number of ethnic Hungarians lived in the area on the remaining side of the Hungarian-Romanian border. Salonta is today lies just 10 kilometers from Hungary, and I might add that I was at a pastor's conference last week in Romania and drove through Salonta on the way. On the way back, we stopped at a grocery store in Salonta to change drivers, and I got out and bought myself a bottle of soda as long as I was there. And when I was in the store, I had never heard a word of Romanian. Everything that went on was in Hungarian. So uh, even though it's on the Romanian side of the border, it's still heavily ethnic Hungarian, at least in that spot. After his father's death, Cornia entered the service of wealthy landowner and lawyer. Um, Cornia's diligence soon brought advancement as he increased his skill in working the land and managing animals. Cornia was responsible for driving the master's carriage, which afforded an opportunity to develop a close relationship with him. He also developed a relationship with uh, Mari Potaki Jigo, a kitchen maid in the Rose Varney household. And on May 23rd, 1866, Cornia married Mari in Salonta and struck out on his own. He became a sharecropper who also raised pigs and poultry. God bless Cornia's first marriage with seven children, and I have them listed. You'll be able to see them when you get the material uh, that I'm working from. He had six girls and one boy. The boy was the youngest. Maria died in 1890, and Cornia the following year married Jujana Tote Mate, the widow of a Mr. Tokach whom he had baptized 10 years previous. The second wife had two children by her first husband. In 1874, Cornia became aware of a new religious movement in his town. Antal Novak, an agent of the British and Foreign Bible Society, did missionary work in Eastern Hungary, Western Romania, and the Northern part of the Balkans. As part of his work, Novak visited Salonta and encountered a group of peasants interested in studying the Bible. Mihai Tot, uh, it's spelled T-O-T-H, but there's no T-H sound in Hungarian, so it's just Tot. Mihai Tot, a friend of Cornia, invited him to a Bible study at the home of a goldsmith named Janos Lajos, uh, which would come out to John Lewis in English. From his study, he became convinced of the necessity of repentance for salvation and that immersion of believers was the biblical pattern for baptism. Closest place 
they could obtain baptism at the time was Vienna. So eager was Laos to follow the Lord that he was willing to sell his house in order to have enough money to buy a train ticket. Novak persuaded him to await the arrival of Henrik Meyer, a missionary sent out by Johann Anken of Hamburg, Germany. How many of you ever heard of Johann Anken of Germany? Show of hands. That's what I was afraid of. Um, let me digress and talk to you a little bit about Anken. Anken was saved um, on a trip to Great Britain, a business trip that his father sent him on. He became a Bible co-porter back in Germany when he returned. He became convinced of Baptist principles and was baptized by Barnas Sears, a professor from Hamilton Theological Institution in Hamilton, New York. Anken had to endure great persecution because of a German prejudice dating back to the Münster Kingdom. That would be approximately during the time of the Reformation. Uh, the Minster Kingdom was a renegade group of quote-unquote Anabaptists who took over the city of Minster, and they did a lot of bad things. But uh, after the city was invaded and they were killed, the stories of what they did continue to grow, and so in the German mind, uh, the reality was bad, but in the German mind, it was far worse. And anything with the name Baptist attached to it was assumed to be the same as the Münster Kingdom. Aachen and his associates were responsible for planting Baptist churches all over Europe, from Paris to St. Petersburg. A study of Aachen would easily be worth a couple of hours of our time. The first Baptists in Hungary were saved as a direct result of Aachen's ministry. A fire destroyed most of the city of Hamburg, where Aachen lived. The work that his church did to help fire victims went a long way toward disarming the prejudice against them. After the fire, artisans came from all over Europe to help rebuild the city. Some of them were German-speaking Hungarians. These Hungarians were saved through their contact with Aachen. On returning to Budapest, they attempted to start a Baptist church, but the time was not right. Hungary was in the throes of a failed revolution against the Habsburgs. Uh, who were the rulers of Austria. As a result, the first lasting effort at Baptist church planning had to await for the little group at Salonta that we're going to be talking about. Cornia spent an exp uh, we're, we're back to Hungary slash Romania now. Cornia spent an extended time studying the Bible before he was convinced. From August, uh, by the by, I don't think I put it in here. Uh, Cornia was 30 years old before he learned to read and the reason he learned to read was so he could read the Bible. From August 24 to 26 in 1875, Meyer explained, examined candidates for baptism very thoroughly as to their understanding of scripture and their personal testimony of conversion. According to Meyer's diary, Cornia expressed a willingness to forsake anything, including the distillation of polygon, uh, that would be whis whiskey, on August 26, under cover of darkness at 3 a.m., Meyer baptized Cornia, his wife, and a few others in the Feher Kurdish River near Dula, which is now in Hungary. From that time on, Cornia testified boldly of his faith in Christ, backed by his changed life. By 1881, the infant church had 47 baptized members. In November of 1877, Anken himself visited Salonta to hold a missions conference, which included workers from Bosnia and what is now Romania, and from Hungary. At the close of the conference, Anken ordained Cornia to the ministry and tote as an elder of the church. The contact with Anken had a great impact on Cornia, for Cornia embodied Anken's motto, every Baptist and missionary. We know that Cornia's evangelistic work started early. In the oldest roster of members of the Salonta Church, Cornia is first on the list, and his occupation is listed as missionary. His wife oversaw the farm work, and their children worked in the fields while Cornia was gone on his many evangelistic tours. His first efforts extended to towns and villages 
within about a 60 kilometer radius of his hometown. One illustrative anecdote comes from his first preaching tour. Cornyn and his son-in-law, Laszlo Balog, entered the village of Bihar Ugra. As the habit of the as the habit of the villagers, they were sitting on benches in front of their homes. The pair of missionaries introduced themselves to various sets of villagers as simple farmers, just as the apostles were simple fishermen, and announced that they wanted to hold worship services that afternoon or evening. No one offered them hospitality or expressed any interest at all. Finally, one of the one old man spoke up. I would receive you into my home, he said, but you know I have an ungodly son-in-law who would not like you. Then, from behind a fence, they heard a voice saying, Well, if I am that ungodly man, because of whom you are not allowed to come in, then just come in. The son-in-law invited the preachers to eat a meal. Cornya started to pray over the meal when the wife of the ungodly son-in-law yanked the food off the table, saying, Do not give thanks like a cow on the ice in front of me. Commenting on his wife's behavior, the young man said, and they think, I am ungodly. Cornya and his companion got up from the table and left the house, accompanied by the son-in-law, who guided them to another house where they would be welcomed. At this home, they were invited to attend a service at the local church, which I presume was probably Hungarian Reformed. After the service, a crowd gathered at the home of their host, and Konya preached to them. A rumor circulated that the two Nazarenes were playing wild at the home of their hosts. Three young men arrived carrying brass cuspidors for the purpose of beating the visitors, but when they saw the owner of the house and his son both quietly listening to the preaching, they did not dare carry out their purpose. Thirty years later, the ringleader of the young ruffians received baptism from Mihai Tote at Salota. When informed of this, Cornya commented, You see, folks, after 30 years, the seed came up. During the early years, Cornya also traveled on evangelistic tours with Meyer, at which time he learned much from his German mentor. By 1881, Cornia was traveling on his own as an independent missionary, baptizing converts and organizing churches. I want to portray Cornia's character and summarize his accomplishment through some anecdotes about his life. Cornia was generous. When he saw a need, he was willing to sacrifice in order to meet it. Two Hungarians went to Germany to train in Aachen Seminary. One of the two, Andras Udvaroki, that would be I'm Andrew in English, would return to pastor a church of 800 members in Budapest and to begin the First Baptist College in Hungary. To meet their urgent financial needs, Cornya sold a span of oxen and sent the money to Germany. This would be the equivalent of a farmer selling his tractor. On more than one occasion, he sold oxen in order to give toward the construction of church buildings. Cornia's home was a center of hospitality. Maria Cornia could never be sure how many would appear at their table for dinner. Their hospitality afforded an opportunity to give food to the needy, to give encouragement to Christians, and a gospel witness to the lost. To visitors from afar, sitting at Cornia's table was like taking a missionary course, a seminary course, excuse me. Even worse, it gave people the opportunity wake up. Even more, it gave people the opportunity to see that Cornya backed up what he preached by the way he lived. Visitors saw an instructive pattern of Christian family harmony. Once an incident shows Cornya's, Cornya's hospitality put to the test. When Cornya was in the grain dealing business, the fifth room of his house served as his granary. One evening, as Cornya and his company were returning from church, they heard a noise from the room in the direction of the attic. A dark figure was trying to lift a sack full of grain. Noiselessly approaching the thief, Cornya helped him put the sack on his back. Embarrassed, the thief wanted to put the sack down and leave, but Cornya insisted that he take it, saying, you must need it, and that's why you came. Later, when you have grain, you can give it back. 
After the thief reluctantly accepted the deal, Koinya insisted that he stay for supper. The thief was forced to sit down, listen to family devotions, and eat the meal. He finally escaped with a sack of grain. That thief eventually repented and trusted Christ as Savior. Koinya was dauntless, and there are many anecdotes that support this. As Koinya entered a village where he was scheduled to preach, he saw two men standing in the road holding clubs. He greeted them pleasantly and asked them what they were doing. They told him that there was a deceiving preacher named Koinya about to enter town, and they were there to prevent him from coming. Realizing that the two had not recognized him, he told them not to treat the preacher too harshly and walked on. After preaching in the village, he left the town by a different route. One can see Cornya's defiance of hardship in the number of times he baptized people in the winter when they had to break the ice in the river in order to perform baptisms. These baptisms were not only a testimony of Cornya's zeal, but also the devotedness of his converts. One could perhaps understand that a single person could have the zeal necessary to stand in the icy waters, but the fact that so many were willing to be baptized in this manner proves the effectiveness of Cornya in communicating his love for Christ to others. Um, in Bihar, some youths set upon him and took him to town, uh, to the town well, where they poured at least 15 buckets of cold water on him, leaving his clothes icy. The incident occurred at about Christmas time. While in jail, and he realized that the prison contained Calvinists, Catholics, Lutherans, Jews, and Greek Orthodox, but no Baptists. Then he said to his fellow prisoners, this high sheriff is an interesting man. He wants to prohibit the practice of the faith of those whom there is no one in the prison. On his release, he said to the high sheriff, sir, thank you for sending me there because none of them were a Baptist in the prison. Now at least one of them was a Baptist. Embarrassed, the high sheriff shook hands, a forced smile on his face. In another village, they tied a cylindrical furnace to his back and beat it with sticks like a drum as they drove him out of town. Yet another village, they tied brushwood to his back before chasing him out. In another place, they chased him out of town, hurling sticks and stones at him. On market day in Bayush, and by the way, I drove through this town on my trip to Romania this time also. The streets crowded with people from surrounding villages. This is market day, okay? So everybody comes from the countryside. Cornya went looking for someone to transport him to a village where he was scheduled to preach. A stranger approached leading a horse and handed Cornya the halter, promising to return in a few minutes. Cornya did not even get the opportunity to protest. He didn't have time to do so before the man disappeared. A short time later, the owner of the horse appeared with the police and accused Cornya of stealing it. Cornya protested his innocence and returned the horse to the owner, but the owner was not satisfied. So the police took him to the city hall. Cornya explained what had happened and was released. By this time, a substantial crowd had gathered. Ooh, the preacher got arrested. He's going to jail. And Cornya took the opportunity to preach to them from Matthew 12, 25. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. According to one version of the story, he mounted the horse he had supposedly stolen and preached from there. Afterwards, five of the hearers were interested enough to follow him to the village where Two hours late, he still kept his pre preaching engagement. For a long time after that, many still accused him of being a horse thief. Few incidents show his raw courage, like the time he was about to be attacked by an angry man wielding an axe. The scene unfolded like this. In 1893, Cornya was preparing for a baptismal service at Kishhaza. Changing tents had been set up beside the river. One of the candidates was a woman whose husband was opposed to her being baptized. She took this opportunity 
because her husband was off in the forest chopping wood and did not know that she was about to be baptized. One of the ladies of the woman's acquaintance found out about what was about to happen and since she also opposed the baptism, sent word to the husband in the forest saying, come, because your wife, Sabetta, went to be baptized. The husband began to curse because his fellow woodcutters began to laugh and mock him. Enraged, the husband took his axe and ran to the site where the baptism was about to take place. He uh, intended to prevent the baptism of his wife, even if he had to kill her in order to do it. He arrived at the site just as the baptism was about to take place. On the husband's arrival, the atmosphere of the meeting turned from joy to fear. The women hid themselves and the men stood around them to protect them. Cornya calmly approached the husband and addressed him kindly. Fracham Andrew, I am glad you came. All right now, come and help us with your axe. It was wise that, uh, to bring your axe. Here is this wooden pole, sharpen it and pin down here to support the tent. If your pin, if you pin this pole down and the wind blows, we do not have to worry that the tent might fall down. Just believe me, Fratje, it will work. See, in the same way, it is good for our earthly tent to have someone beside it, the Lord Jesus Christ, who protects us not to fall down into the depths of hell. Cornel waited for him to finish the job and then said, all right, now stay here and watch the tent. See, these people are standing packed over there. and There's nobody else beside you here to watch. But if you don't want to help, I can call somebody else. It is not necessary, replied the man. I will remain here. Now I will start to preach, and later I will come up to you and ask something, Konya added. Everyone looked on silently as these events transpired, and now a great calm came over them. Konya then preached from Matthew 3.10, and now also the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth not forth fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. He said that everyone who does not receive Christ as Savior is like the fruitless tree. Unless he repents, he will be cut off and cast into the fire. After the preaching, Cornya said to the husband, Will you remain here or will you take your wife home? I will remain here, replied the man. Baptize me too. Silence reigned. By that riverside, tears flowed as Cornya baptized candidate after candidate. Several registered their desire to be baptized at the next baptismal service. Following the baptisms, Cornya preached again on Mark 12, 30 and 31. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. When the service had ended after an hour and a half, Cornya accepted an invitation to eat at Fracia Mandru's house. At the next baptismal service, the husband too received the leader's baptism. When Konya arrived at the village of Gurbendu, the Romanian Orthodox priest from a neighboring village had warned the people that a heretical preacher was coming their way. Konya was arrested as soon as he arrived and imprisoned in a barn with a bull. This bull was so dangerous that no one dared to enter the pen where he was kept. They just threw his food over the wall. Konya was very slender. He hunkered in the corner of the pen. The bull, which had very long horns, was not able to reach Cornya because his horns hit the walls and he was not intelligent enough to turn his head sufficiently to gore the preacher. The bull continued to charge and butt to no avail for several hours until he fell asleep from exhaustion. The warm breath of the sleeping bull kept Cornya from freezing to death on that cold night. Cornia was not allowed to preach at this, his first visit, but God blessed his life, but God used his life to preach. One year later, he baptized 13 converts in that village. Uh, this village was the home of the, um, the parents of one of the preachers that I know in Romania, and he vouches for this story because it was passed down in the village. 
In the village of Tulkai, he was arrested and locked in a cold room in the middle of winter. The judge hoped he would freeze to death or at least be afraid to return to the village for a long time. There was nowhere to sit in the room and Konya shivered in the cold. Eventually, he found a large stone and he began to roll the stone over and over to keep warm. As he sang, Jesus, Savior of my soul, hold me on your breast. He survived the night with undamaged health, rejoicing. The cruelty of the judge created a sympathy among the people, and a number of them responded to his preaching with salvation decisions. One tactic that he sometimes employed was to enter a village and ask to borrow a small table from one of the housewives. He would set the table next to the road and cover it with a black tablecloth. The housewife would ask if someone had died, and he would reply, yes, and if you will come back in about 10 minutes, I will tell you about it. Having gained an audience in this way, he would preach a gospel message. The Greek Orthodox Bishop of Arad had heard that many former Orthodox in Tulka had become Cornyists and resolved to visit the village. A huge crowd gathered to meet him. And the priests who accompanied him at the train station. They arrived in the village in a splendid carriage with great pomp. The wiser ones in the crowd knew that they had come because of Cornya. They go to Tulka because everybody has been a Baptist since Mishka Cornya with their preach. Except for the Baptists, the whole village came to the Mass, which the bishop celebrated. By noon, the Mass was over and the bishop ate dinner. Eventually, the bishop spoke. I have something important to say. Then he addressed the local priest, inviting him to move to Arad. You will be a canon there. Just come, he said. I do not go, replied the priest. But it is a great job, said the bishop. I will not go, the priest repeated. But eventually, you won't have any followers here, protested the bishop. No problem, said the priest. I do not go. I was born here. I have lived here. I will die here. I will not go. But everybody becomes a Baptist here. No problem that they become a Baptist, replied the old priest. They do not quarrel, fight, and steal anymore because these Cornyaists are good people. I have a better life here now, and I do not have much problem with them. It is even better for me here. Cornya recognized the importance of music. Three of his daughters, Maria, Shara, and Therese, translated most of the early Hungarian Baptist hymns from German. This they did anonymous, anonymously without material compensation. The three daughters traveled with their father and even without him to teach the new hymns to the people. Cornia took pity on the sick and afflicted Normally, his first act on entering a village was to inquire about the sick and then to visit them. He would read a scripture text, speak words of comfort, and pray for them. This care that Cornia showed to suffering people enhanced the value of his preaching, for these people who received his attention were more eager to hear his sermons. Cornia's sermons were neither loud nor long. He believed that the appeal of what he should, of what he said should result from content, not from volume. He would not preach long, even if the audience liked it and wanted more. He sometimes began by commenting on the words of the song that had preceded the message. Sometimes he would add thoughts after the message. His messages were full of illustrations which brought the truth home to the audience in ways that they could understand. He did not learn preaching from books. His messages were tailored to his audience to whom he wanted to present Christ. Excuse me. He knew what had saved him and he knew what would save others. He preached everywhere he saw opportunity. In church, in the streets, on trains, once he spoke to a great crowd at the train station in Aradia. On another occasion, he preached at a park in Arad. What gave him delight was not a captivated audience, but the salvation of sinners. Cornya loved children. When old people rebuked children for being happy, Cornya remarked, 
the old wine has forgotten that once it was moosed. On coming home from church, some children ran forward ahead of the group. He said to them, wait. When the swine herd lets the pigs go home, some of them go forward and some just hang behind silently. Which group is more valuable? The, which is the more valuable group that you would choose? The one that hangs behind silently. And why? asked Cornya. Because those are heavier and more valuable, the children said. See if you know which one is the best and more valuable, then you also know which way of behavior is more proper. An argument arose on the proper attire for a bride on her wedding day. The girl in question wanted to wear a long gown, veil, and a wreath. The older people opposed her. Cornya reasoned thus, Dear brothers, it is not good this way, for the girl is not independent before or after the wedding, but only on the day of the wedding. Before the wedding, her parents told her what to do. After the wedding, her husband will tell her what to do. This is the only day in her whole life when she is not under commandments. Why do you want to take away from her this only one day long independence? Let her rejoice in this day and do not take away from her uh, from her nice dress, veil, and bridal wreath, if this is what she desires. The scripture tells us what the beauty of the bride is. We all should go before God in nice clothes. She's coming before God on her wedding day. Nice clothes ought to be worn in weddings, not just in parties. Let her make up her mind in this matter, even though this is not the custom of this village. The Baptists of a certain village were persecuted outcasts. The children of a Baptist widow were forced to endure taunts and ridicule and even violence at school. And as a result, they often came home crying. When Cornya visited their home, he always asked, well, boys, are you still able to carry the cross? And they answered proudly, yes, we are. Cornya was known for his homespun wisdom, some of which an admirer has conveniently collected for us. On debt, if you want something for yourself, count your money first. Have you seen a barrel rolling down it from a hill? The person in debt is like that. The debt eats up the meat from your plate. Owe no man anything but to love one another. A man gave brandy to a monkey. The man drank before the monkey so that the animal could see how to do it. The monkey took it, tasted it, and threw it to the man with anger, since it did not taste good. See how smart the monkey is, but the man keeps on drinking till he gets drunk. A monkey knows what hurts and what is good for him, but the man does not comprehend or accept many times what is good for him and does not want what Christ preaches. Um, I think... This is, these are things that I may want to go back to in a bit. Uh, I'm going to move on. Uh, there's more things here that I'll come back to if I have time at the end, but I want to make sure I get to the end and then I can come back and give you more of that. Cornya's ministry had a remarkable range both in time and space. He traveled in what is now Western Romania from beyond Aradia in the north to Arad and Timisoara in the south. He concentrated on this area and corresponding, the corresponding area on the other side of what is now the Hungarian-Romanian border. At Meyer's invitation, he also preached extensively in and around Budapest. Usually he traveled either on foot or by train if the place he was going to was too far to walk. His biographer estimated that in 40 years of ministry, he traveled on foot the equivalent of six times around the globe. Not all of Cornya's problems came from opposition from the outside. He subscribed, as all Baptists do to one degree or another, to the covenant view of the church. The church is a group of believers who agree to organize themselves into a community based on a certain agreed set of standards and conduct. Failure, failure to live up to the standards of conduct 
is grounds for church discipline. Koinonia's standards were strict. The churches he started practiced strict discipline concerning matters of worldliness. By 1894, many had turned away from Koinonia's strict standards. For a period of about six years, he was not welcomed in many of the churches that he himself had started. He and Andras Budvarnoki, pastor of a large church in Budapest, were on bad terms for a time, owing to what Koinonia regarded as Udvarnaki's worldly clothing. Perhaps our times are not so different from his. He continued active until 1915 when, at age 71, he was too sick to travel. He was also burdened by the loss of his only son in the First World War. He blamed himself for not praying for his son enough. Mihai Jr. had written from the front, Dad, pray for me because when you pray for me, I always feel it. Um, and I should add that uh, Mihai Jr. died a war hero, and we might should remind ourselves that he was on the other side. He was fighting on the German side. On January 3rd, 1917, he made his last trip home to glory. The news of Cornea's death spread rapidly and a large hope of mourners gathered for his funeral. Henrik Meyer attempted to speak at the service but was overcome with emotion. Zygmunt Olafi, a Baptist preacher from a nearby town who had often visited Cornea during his final illness, preached the funeral sermon on John 11.25. And here, I'm going to have a hard time. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Cornea is said by his biographer to have started more than 325 churches and to have baptized more than 11,000 converts. These numbers are extrapolations not based on hard evidence, but even if the real numbers are only half as large, this man of God left a remarkable legacy. Hungary has not seen his life before or since. Okay, I will come back later on to the part that I skipped over, but maybe this would be a good time to, if, if you have questions. Uh, so yeah, I'm just looking through um, <laughs> a comment here, uh, just a, a lot of info. So that's great. Um, yes, if you have questions, please put them in. Um, and then just to get us context, two things, okay. Um, can you give us again the dates birth and death dates. And then can you give us, a, particularly on the early side, um, give us just an overview. I know you're going to do this later on Thursday, but what is going on in the period, particularly in Hungary, this whole region of, uh, of Europe at the time, just kind of to, to orient us and, and get us into the ballpark of what's going on. Um, he was born in 1844, died in 1917. Okay, he was saved in 1875, approximately, and baptized then. Uh, what is going on in the world? Uh, Hungary was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, uh, what is now modern Hungary was uh, Roman Catholic primarily and under the thumb of uh, the Habsburg emperors, uh, so much so that they revolted. And in 1848 and uh, 1849, they had a revolution. Um, they were good soldiers, good fighters, very brave, and they felt that they could defeat the Austrians. But the Austrian emperor hired the Russian Tsar to invade from the east. And they could not fight a two-front war. So they had to surrender. Their 15 top generals were all executed, most of them hanged or beheaded by the Austrians. And we have a holiday every year here to commemorate the death of the 15 generals. Um, that was the time that there was the abortive attempt to start a church in Budapest. Fast forward about 20 years, and um, 
the Austrians needed help fighting a war with the Italians and they wanted Hungarian help. And the Hungarian minister said, all right, you want some help? Let's see if we can make a deal. Um, it helped that the Austrian foreign minister and the Hungarian man um, 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 Francis Diak were on good terms personally. They were friends. And in the negotiations, um, uh, Diak was able to obtain just about all the things that the Hungarians had wanted in the revolution that they had earlier. Only this time they achieved it by peaceful means. And that was the beginning of the dual monarchy. Hungary became a separate country with its own parliament, made its own laws, but they acknowledged the Austrian emperor as being their king. But that gave them a degree of independence that they had not known since before the time of the Turks, the Turkish invasion. Um, so I don't know, is there is anything much momentous other than uh, the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand that set off World War I happened in what was at that time Hungarian territory. So does that help? Very helpful. It's good. Interesting, 1917. So he, uh, right? I mean, he passes before the war is done. Yes. The war that his son dies in. So, no. Very, very helpful. Um, anyone have any other follow-ups here? There's a comment here. Um, I know a Polish man who is a Baptist whose great-grandfather came to Christ when he met some Hungarian Baptists walking in southern Poland in the late 1800s. Wow. Uh, question here. If Hungary is strong Roman Catholic, um, you've given some you know, accounts of how he dealt with that during his ministry. But any other follow-up you want to give as, as far as what that looks like? Um, or specifics, particulars of how he's dealing with that. Yes, yes, I do, and I'd like to take about two hours to do it. So uh, that will be a large part of the content of the course on Thursday. Very good question, and I'll do my best to answer it then. Very good, helpful. Okay, um, I don't think, and nothing else has come in, so we could go back to other content that you left out or however you want to use the time at this point. Okay. I think what I'll do is I'll go on to the other three men I want to talk about, and then we can go back to the other content after that. If you have any questions, um, let's do about, uh, maybe five, 10 minutes now and then take a break. Sounds good. Okay. Our second hero, Liviu Ola was born in Oradio, Romania on May 30, 1934, the second son of Dimitru and Veronica Ola. According to his testimony, at age 13, he knelt in his room and asked Christ to save him. Before proceeding with a recounting of his life, we must remind ourselves that uh, the Romania in which he ministered was a police state. One in 10 adults was a police informer including a large number of pastors in the Baptist Union. Okay, let's stop here and let that sink in for a minute. If you're passing people on the street, you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten adults. That tenth one is a police informer. Uh, it's made people very reluctant to be friendly to strangers, and it made it difficult to witness to people because you didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know who you were witnessing to. And it wasn't safe to do that in church because many of the Baptist preachers had been forced under threat of dire punishment or death to inform on their fellow Baptists. Um, I know of one case where a Romanian preacher got a, a big uh, award recognition in the United States for standing for uh, religious liberty. And all the while, the man was a police informer. Um, I don't want to judge those people. 
I've never been in a situation like that. I don't know how I would react. Um, but if they did say, uh, once they became a police informer, if they said they wouldn't do it anymore, they would be executed. So Ceausescu was a bad guy, a very bad guy. And uh, we have to remember that's behind everything that's going on. Ceausescu took over shortly after the end of World War II, about uh, 48. So he was born in 34. When he was 14 years old is when this happened. After high school, Ola received his law degree in 1955. Feeling led to enter the ministry, he studied at the Baptist Seminary in Bucharest, but was not allowed to finish, probably because of pressure from the secret police. From 1958 to 68, he lived in Timisoara, where he helped Pete Popovich, a pastor with whom he had worked before. During these years of obscurity, he held a variety of jobs, general laborer, accountant, an office worker at a factory in Timisoara. Everywhere he worked, he impressed people with his servant attitude. On September 10, 1960, he married Eugenia Lupechku. God blessed their marriage with one daughter, Diana. In 1968, the church in Timisoara ordained Ola and called him as their pastor. He served in that capacity until 1972. During his tenure, the church increased by 90 members. He was especially effective in reaching college students. This situation was intolerable for the authorities. Because of 25 years of communism, control, communist control of education, religion should be withering, especially among the young. The state removed his authorization to preach, and he moved to a village about 100 kilometers away. At the end of 1973, he was called to be an assistant to Nikolai Kovach, pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Aradia. Uh, it's now known as Emmanuel Baptist Church. The call came because Kovach had suffered a heart attack and the church leaders asked him to invite Ola to be his assistant. When Kovach balked, the church leaders threatened to oust him. Reluctantly, Kovach complied. As we now know, Kovach, who was president of the Romanian Baptist Union from 1968 to 76, was collaborating with the secret police. Ola knew this at the time, but he always treated his pastor with the utmost respect. Ola's years of service were very fruitful. When he came, the church was at a low ebb spiritually. Many of the members were not genuinely born again. Going through the motions of religion, drinking alcohol, getting on through communism by practicing small thefts from the factory or from the field, he challenged them to repent of their sins. The sermons were not long. He started in a normal, normal tone of voice. As the sermon progressed, his voice rose in intensity and tonality, and his delivery increased to an astonishing speed by the end. He often warned of hell and the consequences of sin. He insisted that an unrepentant life was evidence that one was not truly saved. At the invitation, a men's choir of over 100 voices would sing. Often they sang, come, this might be the last call. Normally he preached four to six times on Sunday in various locations. The sermons normally lasted from 15 to 30 minutes. On nearly every occasion, there were salvation decisions. And remember the background of this. This is under a very repressive communist government. People with whom I have talked who heard him preach tell of awakening at 2 a.m. on Sunday to ride the train to Aradia and allow enough time to walk from the train station to the church so as to arrive by 6 a.m. And I have been to that train station many times and driven by the church, and it's not very far by car, but it's a long walk. The service started at 9 a.m., but no one who arrived after 6 would be, could be assured of 
getting a seat inside the church. They occupied themselves with prayer and singing as they waited. Three hours. During this time, at the already large Second Baptist Church, the membership tripled in size, becoming the largest Baptist church in Europe. In the first year alone, he baptized 400 new converts. Again, he was very effective in reaching the youth, much to the chagrin of the secret police. Part of the reason for the explosive growth was Ola's defiance of the authorities by baptizing people who did not come from a Baptist background. This practice was not allowed, but he did it anyway. In 1976, he decided to baptize 70 converts outdoors in full view of the public. This act had not occurred in Aradia since 1942. Most of the people of church supported his decision, but Ola experienced great pressure from a small group of pastors who were under control of the secret police that he should not provoke the communist government. At the In the end, he capitulated. The baptism was held indoors, as many people observed from the outside looking through the windows as were actually inside the building. From this point on, Ola considered emigrating. In 1978, he emigrated to the United States and pastored a Romanian church in the Detroit area for two years. In 1980, he moved to Dallas, where he received a degree from the Criswell Biblical Studies Center. In 1974, he moved to Los Angeles, where he pastored another Romanian Baptist church until 1999. He went home to glory on April 4, 2008. I happened to be in Romania at the time and got the news from a pastor there. At the time, I didn't know anything about him. His health was impaired by repeated strokes over the last several years of his life. The Romanians in the United States were not as receptive to his message of repentance, and his ministry there was not as fruitful. Unlike Cornia, he had little impact on the Hungarian side of the border, probably due to the difficulty of border uh, cross-border traffic and communication during the communist era. In evaluating the impact of his ministry, we must also bear in mind that he faced the police state apparatus of one of the cruelest dictatorships of the age, headed by Nikolai Ceausescu. Ola confessed to three major influences on his theology. Anybody want to guess? Probably not. Charles Spurgeon, Charles Ryrie, and A.W. Tozer. What were the secrets of Ola's success? His ministry was built on three pillars. Number one, the necessity of prayer. Even while he was still a child living at home, Ola's mother found him in prayer in quiet places. When asked the reason for the success of Second Baptist, Ola turned to a child and asked, how many people are on your prayer list? The child replied that there were 86. That, said Ola, is the secret of our success. He wrote a book on prayer entitled The Great Importance of Prayer. Ola prayed that God would open the opportunity for the gospel to go forth on television and radio in Romania when no one thought that that was possible. And today it is a reality. Although he never boasted about it, Ola customarily prayed four hours a day. And I said this in camp last week and immediately a couple of the men that were saved under his ministry contradicted me and said, no, it wasn't four hours, it was eight hours. So I'll let the four hours stand, but the files of the secret police also attest that he prayed for extended periods of time. That was number one. Number two, his ministry was built on the necessity of repentance. He stressed that repentance from sin is necessary to salvation and also to the Christian life. Romanians derisively call Baptists repenters. Ola said that the repenters needed to repent. The Christian life must be a holy life. And number three, the necessity of soul winning. 
Although blunted by the efforts of the secret police and the compromise of the Baptist Union, Livio Ola's impact remains today and it changed lives of Romanians who responded to his message of repentance and faith. And I just heard my clock chime for three o'clock here. So I think it's a good time to take a break. And I hope we'll have some questions after the break. Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, let's take a five minute break. It's right on the, no, it's one minute after the hour. So I will see us all back at six minutes after the hour and we'll pick up from there. Very okay. good, thank you. Great. Left off. Um, a couple of questions here and others feel free to just drop questions in. Um, Brother John Glass is wanting to know, you said your primary source was a book you mentioned. Uh, any, what, like where is it possible to get that book or the title? Um, its title is Cornia Chronica. Uh, this is all in the notes that you will get. Um, pretty much everything that I've said, um, a lot of it I, I just read. And uh, you'll be getting that right after class is over, I think. So I didn't want you looking at that and reading along with me. Um, so that's why you don't have it now. But you will have it and you'll have the name of the book. The problem is the book is only in Hungarian. There is another biography of Cornia that's in Romanian. And I don't know uh, if that's just a translation of the Hungarian book or if it's a separate biography. I've seen it, but I don't read Romanian, so I don't know. Um, I am working off an English translation that one of our co-workers here did, uh, but there, it's not published in English. So unless you can read Hungarian, you're up a creek. And I need permission to circulate it. To circulate the translation. Well, uh, unfortunately, both my Hungarian and my Romanian are just extremely rusty. Um, okay, <laughs> then I don't know any words, <laughs> not one. Um, someone here. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, uh, Brother Clay Gibbons was following up. Also, I was interested in Zemtan, Brenda Zemtan Lien's question about the Roman Catholics' resistance and uh, so forth. So. Um, we'll have to wait on that, I think, if I'm understanding. Um, the, Roman like we'll Catholics, say. the Roman Catholics did not have the influence in Transylvania. Uh, what happened after the Turks invaded, um, the Turks took over control of the central part of Hungary, and the Austrians retained control of the western part, and the eastern part, which was mainly Transylvania, uh, became sort of an independent state under the under the authority of of the Turks, but they were allowed to have their own government and they were ruled by Transylvanian princes. And and the Transylvanian princes may or may not have been Roman Catholic, but they allowed a great deal of freedom. So um, the um, the Calvinists, the, uh, the Lutherans, the Catholics, and even the Unitarians. This was a big, uh, Transylvania was a big center for Unitarianism as well as Poland. Um, but the, the, the Catholics did not have the power in Transylvania that they did in the western part of the country and then after the Austrians took over uh, the rest of the country. They were particularly hard on the central part and very repressive. So more about that on Thursday. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, just this, this last vignette you were giving us, one of the things that stuck out to me strongly was, so he's, he's doing things that are um, obviously just in defiance of the government um and how is that even possible with you know with the kind of power that they had and the kind of control that they had is it just because he has enough people around him they're concerned about some kind of you know, outbreak of civil dissent if they if they take him um you know what's the dynamic that allows him to do some of these things and survive um there's something that psychologists call a preference cascade and when you're in a repressive state, 
like Romania was. Everybody's isolated from everybody else because you're afraid to talk to anybody about what you really think. One in 10 were police informers. You might be talking to a police informer. You don't dare say what you really think. And once you understand that most other people think the same way you do, that's when the government falls. That's what happened in 1989 when communism fell in East Germany and then the dominoes just started falling because everybody realized everybody else thinks the same way I do. And they couldn't command the fear that they had before. So I, it may be that there was fear on the part of the state about that. Um, they were afraid to arrest him. They were afraid to whatever. But they did their best to put pressure on him using their leverage with the Baptist Union to do it. And he finally threw up his hands and left. Uh, and there, are those, there are those in Romania that, that think that he made a mistake when he did that, that he should have stayed. Um, and when he left, they basically allowed him to immigrate because they were happy to get him out of the country. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, there is a, a, am I correct? There is kind of a diaspora of Romanians that are coming out during that era. Is that right? Yes. Um, if you take a survey of Romanians, and ask them their opinion of the United States, it would be very low. Um, we have missionary friends who, when they first moved there, they their phone was tapped. Uh, there was an apartment that was across from them that had listening equipment that was aimed at them so they could pick up their conversations. They thought they were CIA agents. This is after communism fell. They still had that mentality. and. You know, America's a bad place, et cetera, et cetera. But then um, they took a survey that revealed this, and then they asked them, if you could immigrate to America, would you? And something like 90% of them said yes. Um, before we came to Hungary, we lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. There was a large Romanian Baptist church there, and we invited them to come and worship with us. And on a Sunday night, oh, I don't know, 150 of them came and crowded out our auditorium. And they did a whole bunch of really, really good special music. Um, it was a joy to have them. But they were scattered all around the Bay Area. And eventually they broke up in separate churches because it was just too much to travel. So, yeah. And um, Ola ministered among the Romanians in L.A. and Detroit. Fascinating. Uh, I know where there's a Romanian Baptist church in the Detroit area. Um, question here, as far as the Romanian diaspora in the United States goes, so a couple of times I've run across uh, a group of Russian immigrants in the U.S. And so they, they, come, they come over and they're escaping in some way, some kind of oppression or so forth. They come over to the U.S. and they're shocked by um, some of the cultural realities of the U.S. and are not, not necessarily integrating culturally, which has its good sides and its bad sides. Um, but they're concerned very much to maintain, like cross genera generationally, the kind of seriousness and awareness that they brought with them when they first arrived. But typically, the second generation doesn't keep it. Did some of these dynamics hit the Romanian diaspora in the U.S. when they came? Is there a parallel story? Or is it too general? Enough personal experience on that to give you a really informed view. My guess is that that's true. That the first generation is pretty serious. And after that, it, things kind of go downhill. The United States is a great place to be a materialist. I'm skipped out there. The United States is a great place to be a materialist. Right, All right, indeed. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions. We can go to other content or however you want to use the time here. 
my wife gave me a postcard. This is a map of old Hungary, greater Hungary. The part in the middle is modern day Hungary, current Hungary. And the parts around the outside are the parts that split off from Hungary after World War I. Um, I will be giving you um, a map um, in the material for Thursday. So you can see that. It's currently, it's only a third the size that it was back then. Okay, two more quote unquote minor Transylvania heroes. The first of these is Dr. Q. Dr. Q practiced medicine during the communist era in Romania in Bihoria County. He was known in the community for his Christian faith and testimony. Frequently, he heard a knock at the door in the middle of the night. The police would take him to jail just to harass him. Persecution can become very wearisome over a period, long period of time, and they exhausted him. Eventually, he learned of a plot against his life, so he walked into the police station of his own volition and asked the police to carry out their plan and kill him. That didn't happen. God intervened, he was not killed. Eventually he immigrated to the United States and settled in South Carolina. He was not able to practice medicine with his Romanian credentials, but he did obtain a license as a physician, uh, as a physical therapist. And he now resides in the United States and ministers to Romanian expatriates. I'm getting the extraneous noise from the outside. Let me shut the window again. Uh, the second one is Yenu Chapi. I know it looks like Gino. It's spelled J-E-N-O, but it's Yenu. Trust me on that one. And Yenu is equivalent to Eugene. He was an ethnic Hungarian Baptist preacher who lived in Romania. His widow is now a member of my church. He has two sons-in-law who are church planters and a grandson-in-law who is a church planter. And I have, um, I have met all of his children. I've had a part in training two of the three church planters. Shopi was one of the preachers of a revival in Romania that saw new converts baptized by the thousands in the 1970s. That revival was no small thing given the fact Romania was under the thumb of a very repressive communist dictatorship. Because of his Christian witness, Shopi was constantly harassed by the police. They would come to the door in the middle of the night and take him to jail only to release him the next morning. The experience was traumatizing for his six children. His widow testifies to God's deliverance in one particular incident. A man came to their door seeking food, claiming to be a Christian brother. They invited him in, but soon realized that he was a fake since he did not know how to pray. They pointedly asked him to leave, and he did. The next day, the police came to the door looking for the man. They were amazed when the family informed him, uh, informed um, that um, the man they had been looking for indeed had come to their house, but they had sent him away. The police informed them that the man was a murderer and had killed people at the previous three places he had stayed. Shopee's preaching emphasized personal holiness. For that, he was not only rejected by the communists, um, but also by the Baptist Union. When the Union disciplined him out of their church, he started one of his own in his own home. Soon his church was better attended than the Union Church. As such, he was an independent Baptist before there was such a thing as a Romanian or a Hungarian independent Baptist. I wish I could have known Yenu Shapi personally, but in a way, I think that I do by knowing his family. His memory deserves to be preserved. One further note. Uh, 
a factor in the fall of communism was new means of communication. Um, fax machines played an important part as news spread rapidly. One event helped to light the fuse of the revolt was a prayer meeting held in the open by a group of Baptists. The police shot into the crowd and killed worshipers indiscriminately. Revulsion at this slaughter was a turning point that led to the overthrow of the Ceausescu government. All right, that is it, except for the material that I want to go back to. Any more questions up to this point? Uh, so, he, well, here's just a, a point of um, maybe a related or side note. Is it true that in Hungary to name children, one needs approval from the government? That is true. Uh, there is a book that contains a list of approved names. If you select from that book, then the, the name is pre-approved. You don't have to worry. If you want to name your child something else, you have to apply to the government for permission. So that is true. Where did that question come from? Uh, maybe just a point of curiosity. That's, that's bizarre to me. Uh, can you explain the cultural dynamic of that, that that's an acceptable or workable thing to do? I mean, what, what's the rationale behind it? Or do people? Um, I'm not sure what the rationale is. That's just the way they do it. Very interesting. They don't want okay. a bunch of weird names. I suppose. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Uh, and um, they celebrate name days, too. Um, they often celebrate the name day more than they do the birthday. Every name is associated with a day on the calendar. Uh, my name day is December 30th. And often there's more than one name for a day. Um, I assume that that means that that's the day associated with your patron saint who would have the same name as you. Okay, interesting. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, as someone's just commented here that the idea of Christians rejecting, even persecuting their own who want to live godly. I re I'm assuming this is probably in respect to the Baptist Union. Um, could you comment, though, on the Baptist Union during this era and just what that looks like or what, what the dynamic is? What's going on with that? Um, well, let me first say this. There are probably more Baptists in Aradia, Romania. Um, that's another place where all the street signs are bilingual. Um, when I walk into the train station there, I'm as likely to hear someone speaking Hungarian as I am Romanian. Um, there are probably more Baptists in that city than there are in all of Hungary put together. Um, the, during the communist era, the, the Baptists were under a great deal of pressure. They were forced into a union with other, with other groups like um, there are some brethren, um, um, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals. Um, they, were, they were forced into them, uh, into an association with them so that the government could more easily control them. And a lot of the Baptists more or less um, cooperated with the government. Uh, the number of churches that closed, the Baptist churches that closed under the communist era, well, runs into the hundreds. Um, it, was a, it was a difficult time. And uh, as I said before, I don't know what I would have done under those circumstances. I would like to think I would have stood strong. But I've never experienced that. Does that help? No, it's helpful. That's very helpful. Um, what you just alluded to in this, this cross-border area, is that a general reality of Romania versus Hungary? Number of, of Baptists is much more significant in Romania, Romania in general than in Hungary? Yes. Yes, the second largest uh, group, religious group in Romania is Baptist. The, it's like dominantly the Romanian Orthodox, like 96% is Romanian Orthodox. So to say it's the second biggest group doesn't mean it's huge, but it, I think it is significant that the second largest group is Baptist. Okay. But the, there's a distinction there where, so during the communist era, the largest 
religious group is going to be Catholic in Hungary. Um, yes. And Romania largest group is going to be Orthodox. Yes. That's correct. But both of those groups, are they deeply tied in with the regime? Are they working together hand in hand with the regime, kind of the way the Russian Orthodox Church does during the, some um, parts of the communist era? Yeah, I, would, I would say that they're under the control of a regime and they wouldn't do anything without official permission. They're not going to have a baptism out in the river. Okay. And then uh, last follow-up question, and then we can go to your, um, oh, well, I have some other questions coming in here. But um, so what, or, well, I don't want to steal thunder from you on Thursday, but what dynamics would be part of the Romanian significant, <laughs> comparatively speaking, Baptist presence as opposed to the Hungarian? I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, okay. It, originally, it was all Hungary. It just, the border is kind of arbitrary. It was, it was drawn up in Paris, and the Hungarians had never forgiven the rest of the world for what happened, that they lost two-thirds of their territory. And I'm fond of pointing out that the United States did not sign that treaty. Of course, I don't tell them that our president very much wanted to sign it and that he was one of the architects of it. Don't tell him I said that. We'll keep it under our hats, I promise. Okay. So in that way, President Wilson is an embarrassment. Um, there were a couple of comments that came in here. Uh, Brother Kenneth was asking, where did these Baptists go then? And I think what you're asking is in respect to the Baptist, so the Baptist Union thing happens um, and the regime puts them together. Then at that point, I guess what you're asking, Brother Kenneth, or if you want to follow up here further, just where Baptists would attend. And presumably, I, I suppose they're making the same decision that their ministers are having, correct? Or, okay, when they close these churches, well over 100 churches close. Um, yeah, I think any, most of the people just kind of dropped out. Maybe they went to another church in the area, but churches are pretty spread out. And there's a mentality here that you go to the church that's in your neighborhood. We moved to a place that's uh, about two blocks from the old Baptist Union Church here in the city where we lived. And a lot of people assumed that we would start going to the Baptist Union Church when we moved here because you walk to church. Um, Two-thirds of our church members live within walking distance of our church. That's the mentality. Do you have a dynamic there? You know, the, um, so you have the, the Roman persecutions, and then during Augustine's time, you have this difficult issue about whether you're, you're going to let those people back into the church that may be dropped out. Um, so if they failed, if they lapsed, are they going to be just completely rejected or can they be reaccepted and so forth? Do you have any of that kind of dynamic post communism, the fall of communism, you know, early nineties and so forth? Not that I'm aware of here in Hungary. Um, in Romania, yes. Uh, one of the issues for independent Baptists is that they don't want to accept the pastors that cooperated with the secret police unless those pastors openly acknowledge and repent of what they did. And the, the Baptist Union um, just wants to kind of cover over that and pretend it didn't happen. Which the, the requirement for some statement of repentance seems, seems really plausible and reasonable reasonable but yeah. anyway I know there are all kinds of cultural and ethical dynamics that kick into these things but it seems like a plausible expectation. Now, I don't doubt that there are a lot of good, sincere people, good Christians who are in the Baptist Union. I know there are here in Hungary, and so I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Um, but I mean, is it wide enough that there are Baptist Union churches that are, you would say, legitimately healthy churches, or not so um, much? Yes, I, I, I would say yes. Um, I know some... I know some um, Baptist Union pastors that I would say these are good men. Um, and I would gladly have fellowship with them on a personal level, even though I couldn't fellowship with, uh, we couldn't fellowship as churches, but we could fellowship personally. 
Um, I sat down and had uh, lunch. I bought the lunch with the pastor of the old Baptist Union Church here. There are three Baptist Union churches in town. One of them is well over 100 years old. And uh, we talked and we found out we got a lot of common ground. But they do pulpit exchanges with a Catholic bishop. And I turned him to Romans 16, 17. And I said, uh, to me, it's just a matter of whether you obey or not. And he didn't have anything to say. Very interesting. He preaches the gospel. Um, I keep on saying that this is the last thing I would ask you, but then I keep on, there's something I wanted to follow up on. As, so in recent history, um, Hungary has kind of taken an illiberal turn or a, a, a very different turn from the rest of the EU. Um, is there any likelihood of increasing pressure again that you, let's say you would experience your ability to be there and minister or that would be uh, two churches we're sympathetic to, that they're going to be under some political pressure? You have been listening to the news media too much. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Let's hear it. <laughs> um, this is a democratic country. Um, we, uh, we had talked about uh, taking charge of some of the area around our church. Um, everything that is farther away than say half a meter from our church is public property. We own the ground that the church is on, but that's it. And we want to take responsibility for this, maybe set up some park benches, cut the grass. And so uh, my former coworker asked the city if that was okay to do it. And the city guy said, Yes, it is. It's fine. And if somebody objects, you just tell them Hungary is a free country. No, we have not experienced any, any repression, any persecution, and don't expect to. And the, all the information about Hungary being illiberal uh, is mostly just flat out wrong. Uh, there are some things that the current government has done that I don't agree with, but they're not repressive. Not to well, us. Great. Glad to get that cleared away. Thanks for, uh, thanks for clarifying that, helping me out. <laughs> okay. um, so I finally have run out of things to follow up with you on. I'm happy to go back to that other content. Okay. Uh, we were talking about wise sayings. Um, that's where I left off is wise sayings of Mihai Cornia. See my bald fist? The little finger is able to squeeze the most. In this way, in the spiritual realm, the person who sees himself the least can be the humblest. After he preached in a village, people drove him out with pitchforks. After that, he said, no problem, the seed is planted and it will come out even if it takes 25 years. The smart one uses more oil at night reading than wine. If someone wants to find God, First, he needs to meet Jesus. I would not want to be an angel because angels are only servants and Christ did not die for them, but he died for me. Beware of the flatterer because he either has deceived you or will deceive you. We should be like the threshold which endures people stepping on it. Do you like cleanness? If I only look to the yard from the street, I can tell what kind of owner lives there. And if I only enter the house, I know what kind of housewife lives there. It is not good to drink wine, especially not on Sunday. It is not allowed to go to the presence of the Lord with wine in us, like the sons of Aaron. You can learn from the ox, see how strong he is and does not drink wine. No wheat or grass grows by wine. The Lord says, be ye holy, for I am holy. But for medical purposes, you can drink some with control. Debt eats with man from the same plate. I like that one. If one of you is sick, 
he should send his offering to the church because a true believer ought to do it. If someone is saved, there is no such sin that could not be forgiven by love. The centurion says to the soldiers, Tailors, step out and fix my coat. But some of those who stepped out said, Excuse me, our names are Taylor, not our profession. This is the way some Christians are, only their names are Christian. We cannot put on the clean clothes until we put off the dirty ones. Cornya said to a girl, when you, be, when you become a believer, when I am baptized, she said, first you should be a believer and then be baptized. Whose daughter are you? asked Cornya. My father's and my mother, she answered. And will you, when you'll be, will you become God's? Follow the example of the rain and its water because it flows together to one place. But you are scattered and remain home, he said alluding to the fact that when it rained, the attendance was less. Think about that for a minute. It is in vain to the ox to pull the plow if the plow does not plow the ground. In other words, in our lives, it should be seen that Christ is working. In listening to the preaching, the first quarter is for the heart, the second quarter is for the ear, the third for the seats, and the last for the walls. I think he was probably complaining about long sermons. Even if the sea would be ink and the grasses would be pens, it would be not enough to write down the love of God. I would rather watch for wolves than hide sins in my heart. It is not a problem to be poor because our Father is rich and he gives when we ask him. Cornia was also famous for his examination of baptismal candidates. He first questioned the candidate on his understanding of Bible doctrine in general and of the gospel in particular. Then he questioned the candidate about his change of behavior after salvation. Here are sample questions on each topic. On Bible doctrine, who was Jesus Christ? When did the Lord order the Lord's Supper? By whom can we be saved? On the new life, he asked such questions as, have you sinned? Have you stolen your neighbor's duck? Have you loaded your wagon with someone else's corn? Have you beaten your wife? His biographer has collected accounts of a number of these examinations. Here I quote from the biographer. What makes the cattle grow? A man in the middle of his life came to Cornia as a candidate. His weakness was that he really liked wine, and as a result, it caused him, his family, and others a lot of troubles. Cornia was well informed of the candidates, and therefore, he was able to ask the right questions. When he answered the first kind, the biblical questions, the, uh, the second kind then came about his life. People were afraid of this category the most because they had to open themselves. Well, Gabor, what makes the cattle grow? Asked Cornya. Hay and corn was the answer. Did you give hay and corn to your young cow right after it was born? Asked Cornya. The man is staring at the church. Uh, the man is staring and the church is smiling. Many of them know what the answer should be, but the man who likes wine has a hard time figuring this out. What has made your cattle grow so big that it can grow, that they can now eat hay and corn. The milk, the man says. Yes, the milk. And if you had given wine to the animal, would it have grown so big? No, that would not have made it grow so big, was the answer. What is then a stronger and more useful drink, milk or wine? The milk, said friend Gabor. And which one do you want to drink in the future? What have you decided? I rather choose milk, he said. And who will guarantee that this is what will happen in your life? Friend paused for a while. And after hearing the question again, he said, well, I myself, with the help of the Lord Jesus, the candidate was accepted. 
a young man was interviewed who had smiling eyes and who was always cheerful. Although he answered all the questions well, since he kept on smiling, some believed that he was not serious and did not want to accept him. Cornya asked him to be ready for the next baptism. This man came again, but in vain, because he was rejected this time also. He was sad and did not say anything, but stood aside. The church people went to the river to the baptism, and this boy was forgotten. When all of them were baptized, Cornya noticed the boy standing there with tears in his eyes. Well, Jula, now I see your face, said Cornya, and he hugged him and baptized him. Sometimes Cornya asked the candidates at the same time first and then asked them individually. He asked a young girl from Central, what do you want here? I would like to be a believer, she said. Who convinced you? Nobody. All right, just go to the party tonight where the young people are. You can dance there. You cannot dance in the church. But I rather would like to come to the church. I don't want to go to the parties. I do, want, do not want to dance, she answered. Where is it better for you? Here in the church. But what attracts you, asked Cornya. My faith and love for the Lord Jesus. When did you buy this faith? From hearing and reading the Bible, she, she was accepted. The candidates from St. Job were not able to answer the questions. Cornya expressed this by saying, if the grapes are not ripe, it is not time to harvest. A friend was accepted and was ready to be baptized, but his wife asked Cornya to postpone the baptism until the fall. Cornya asked the woman, do you have children? Yes, I do. When did you deliver the baby? In May. Why did you not postpone it till the fall? Because it was impossible. Postponing his baptism is also impossible because this is about birth also, a new birth. When a rich young man was questioned after the biblical questions, Cornya asked the man, does your cat know that you want to be a believer or do you still kick up the cat? No. Do you mean no, it does not know yet? I do not kick it up anymore, said the man. Does your ox know that you want to be a believer and you do not beat it, his nose anymore? I do not beat his nose. I have changed. Who changed you? The Lord Jesus, because he was very patient with me. Is your mother sad because of you? No, she's glad. How long do you want to live this changed life? Until I die, he said. May God help you, said the widow mother. So the mother obviously agreed that he changed. A prosperous Romanian man was a candidate. In his village, these prosperous Romanians had long hair. Cornia asked him, if the church accepts you, I will not baptize you with long hair. It is not enough to be a good man for the Lord should um, a good man for the, for the Lord, you should sacrifice something for him also. If you cut your hair, the people in your village will see the difference between the old and the new man. The Romanian fellow had his hair cut by the time of the baptism. Two women who are good friends wanted to be baptized. They always helped each other and came to church first because of each other. The questions were done. But Cornya said, now is the fall and the water is frozen. Let's postpone the baptism until next spring. But the ladies were not afraid of the water and insisted on being baptized. They were baptized that day. This is something I can't imagine. I'm deathly afraid of water, especially cold water. Um, a girl successfully passed the biblical questions when Cornya asked her, do you still shut the door after your mother when you are angry? I don't do it anymore and behave differently, Uncle Cornyo. She was sent out and the mother was asked if she can recognize the change in her daughter's behavior. The mother gave a clear testimony of the girl and she was accepted. A 27-year-old man stood in front of Cornyo. He was 
very good looking and his clothes were attractive and his hair well combed up. While, he, while interviewing him, Cornya, with his hand, changed the man's hairstyle to make it more conservative and said to him, it looks better now. Make your heart look nice by being humble and meek and combing your hair down. The young man insisted to him, uh, listened to him, and followed his advice, and a year later was baptized. A young man during his training to be a woodworker wanted to be baptized. After the biblical questions, Cornya, pointing at the table and the bench, said to him, See, both have wooden boards. What is the difference between these two wooden boards? One of them is thick and the other is thin. All right, what else? One is stronger, the other is weaker. Okay, and what else can we know of them? The young man was looking, thinking, and said, one has painted the other its own color. Cornya smiled and said, you hit the nail on the head. In other words, one is sincere and the other is hypocritical, following the devil. Which do you want to be like? I want to be a sincere Christian. Life is not tree table. Then you will be a strong Christian and the devil will not be able to deceive you. He was accepted. A serious and reliable young man, after the biblical questions, was asked by Cornya, if you found $100 on the street, how much would you give to missions of this money? He was thinking and thinking and finally said, nothing, because this money is not mine since someone has lost it. I will take it to the parish hall. He was dismissed for some time, and the members argued over the answer, but finally concluded he was a very serious and honest person, and the church accepted him. A man with a paralyzed leg was questioned. Cornya beat the lame leg with his hand and asked, do you feel it? No. Then he beat the other leg. Do you feel it? Yes. This is like the Christian life. One is senseless, the other is sensitive to the teaching of Christ. Which of your legs are you glad for? The sensitive one. Why? Because it is healthier. Now, could you be a healthy Christian? Yes, that is what I want. He was accepted. Questions? Uh, one thing that's striking to me about just that series of anecdotes that you're going through is the it's the question it's the issue throughout okay is a person um accepted or not which is a thing we've hit a couple of times early on a discussion with dr armstrong on baptism of the fathers we hit this a bit during the survey of theological education um so some of the early periods of theological education the primary way it's happening is that you're, it's the catechismate, you're taking people through the process of catechizing them before they're accepted into the church. Is that part of the dynamic that's going on during his era? It's not just, um, you know, you join the church by smiling and shaking hands afterwards. Uh, we have you stand up and everybody kind of does a, a vote, you know, but it's a significant discussion here before we're willing to say, this is a person that we're going to baptize and accept you into the church. Any comment there? Uh, yes. Um... This was something I think that was very important to Cornya. It wasn't necessarily important to all the Baptists and they sort of, uh, some of them got away from it. And that was one of the causes of tension where he was, he was not allowed in some of the churches he started. He wasn't even allowed to attend. Um, but it reminds me a bit of uh, the story about D.L. Moody uh, after he was saved, he wanted to join, I think it was a reformed church, and they examined him for his membership, and they decided that um, he didn't know enough. He just wasn't well enough educated in the scripture, and they would not accept him. Um, and he had to come back a second time before he would, before he would be accepted. Um, I think he was genuinely saved. But just because he didn't know a lot, they were reluctant to do it. That's the United States. Interesting. Um, during the communist era, is that expectation tightened up? And then 
last question is, or connected question, uh, at least in interactions I had with Russians, um, some of their theology is, is, is affected by what they experience. So that you know, they have a much stronger, they, they have a, there's a strong motif there of people assuming that you can lose your salvation just because they had people that turned away under pressure. So do you have some of the, those same dynamics there or any comments related to that? Um, I don't really have any comments related to that so much as um, I too have had a limited experience with Russians. Um, a good friend of mine um, did uh, modular classes in Moscow back when that was possible after communism fell and before Putin took over. Um, and one of the pastors there that was taking the class said, uh, uh, requested prayer that the, con that the uh, repression would resume. He said, uh, we don't know how to do church discipline. And now we have all kinds of people coming in and we don't know whether they're really serious or not. It's a popular thing to do to come into the church now. And if the repression comes back, then we don't have to worry because we know that the people who want to be members are serious. So, yeah, I do think that um, that 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 has an effect. Um, that that people uh, know that there's a cost to it, and they're afraid um, if they're not serious. That's a very fascinating dynamic. I, that, that gives me, I guess, an interpretive grid for an experience I had years ago. Well, I say it was probably four years ago with a, um, a group of Chinese students. And then a comment was made to me that as they were observing the practice of religion in the Philippines, they see a lot of different cults, which we have, especially, I mean, here in Manila, myriad cults. Um, so there's every possible configuration of heresy. We have it all. Uh, and their comment was, we, I, they said, the guy said, uh, so my conclusion is it's much better the way that we have it where you can't practice your religion freely because that way you don't have all these cults. And that was the way it was left. Um, I don't know exactly how to interpret that. I think he's, he's probably little wrong on that. I think the reality is the church has to be able to function in all kinds of different settings. So, right. I mean, there's, you know, we can't really pick the society we happen to be planted in. We just have to be able to deal with it and work with it. But anyway, it was an interesting dynamic and a lot more nuanced maybe than people in the West would assume about the practice of religion and freedom to do so. Um, any thoughts there? Um, I don't know. Just, um, First Timothy 2, uh, pray that we'd be able to live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness and honesty. Um, and that's what I pray for that publicly. Uh, we just had an election here not long ago and before the election, in fact, the day of the election. That's how I prayed that the election would come out. And I think it did. That's a very good, that's a very good, um, it's a very good biblical piece of data to bring to bear on it. That's good. Very helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, if anyone else has a thought here or a comment here, there's a couple of comments here in respect to what we were just discussing here. Uh, John Glass coming, there's a lot of security in a totalitarian society that results in fear when choice is given. So when you know, these, these people in that situation come out, now there's freedom, yeah. then there's unknown. What do you do now? How's this gonna work? Um, how do we, what do you say, how do we, the church, now compete in the free marketplace of ideas if all of the ideas can be tossed out there together? Uh, Brother Kenneth, it's harder for cults to exist, but they do in China. Um, John Glass, but that's a problem in any free consumer. There's no people or religious other than evolution theory. Um, yeah, interesting. Good, good comments, or if someone else wants to add anything, feel free. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Potter, I very much want to thank you for your time here, and we're looking forward to being back with you again on Thursday, get a broader picture of the history in Hungary and how this fits into some of these same dynamics. And let me go ahead and do this while I'm thinking of it. I just pasted in here the Dropbox link to the notes that he mentioned. So if you want to pull that, you can pull that out of the chat right now. Of course, you can just go, if you go to, what, to the Moodle page, it's that same link there. 
And so you can grab it there from the Moodle page just right underneath this lecture. Um, and on Thursday, as he's already said, we'll be picking up with a broader picture of Hungary and uh, the Reformation and, and then the development of Protestantism in Hungary. Um, uh, one or two other comments I want to put in here before we close out, please, uh, as you have questions that you want to have addressed in our final lecture, please go ahead and give those to me. So that would be a week from this Thursday. And the sooner you're able to give me those topics, the sooner I can start preparing and then Lord willing, hopefully, uh, the better quality of answers I hope to give you. I am also looking forward to having Dr. Armstrong come back. And so he'll give us some of his time. And then as we have, depending on the question, we may be able to call others in. So please, either through the Moodle page at the bottom, it's the final lecture. You can click in there and you can add your questions there. You can directly email me. Um, you can send me a letter just so lo long as it gets here within the next week and a half. That's a joke. But anyway, somehow contact me and get me in the information of your question, and I'm happy to work with those. And then we will be talking about paper topics um, that I think will be in our final lecture. So as you have thoughts there, again, what we're hoping is something that's related to historical theology. That could be a historical interpretation. We discussed that. You could pick a passage. Uh, somewhere in Galatians. And then we looked at that, you know, you could take Augustine, you could go all the way through, uh, you could follow multiple interpreters and see how that develops. That was an example we discussed. Something like that could be a really fascinating paper. There are all kinds of things you can do in historical theology. So feel free. Um, as, again, as you have ideas or thoughts, something you're interested in writing on, message me and we'll talk about it. Okay, that's it. Uh, Dr. Potter, thank you again for your time, and we'll look forward to seeing you back again on Thursday. Okay, thanks to all. Uh, and to all, I hope you will, we will see you back again. Thanks so much.